This panel will be moderated by our good friend and climate champion, uh, Representative Gabrielle Stebbins. Um, Representative Stebbins is moderating this panel as uh, the co-chair of the legislature's Climate Solutions Caucus. Um, welcome, Attorney General. <laughs> So, um, but Gabrielle actually plays multiple roles and wears multiple hats across our network. Um, uh, thankfully, she serves on our board of advisors as well and is also employed by a very um, valued network member, Energy Futures Group. Um, so thank you, Gabrielle, for all you do for the network and the state of Vermont and excited to hear you introduce and uh, moderate this panel. Thank you, Jared. And uh, good morning, everybody. So again, the reason why I'm here is wearing my hat as co-chair of the Climate Solutions Caucus. This is the largest issues-based caucus in the Vermont General Assembly. We have over 90 people. It's a majority from both the House and the Senate. Uh, and um, my co-chair, who represents the Senate side, couldn't make it. So that's why I have this lucky opportunity. Uh, we did receive a text uh, from uh, Treasurer Pichak that he is on his way, uh, hence the empty seat at the end. So before, I, before we start, um, I just want to explain the approach for this a little bit. First of all, I want to thank all of our panelists. This is quite an unusual uh, approach to take. We have uh, representatives, senators, and then we have many of our uh, statewide uh, official leaders. So great to hear, particularly since we just heard that we are behind our goals. Great to hear so many different perspectives from so many different roles in the state in terms of what they think we can be doing and hopefully what you will be planning to do. I apologize if you can't hear me well. I went to an event where many people got COVID. I do not have COVID, but this is me trying to make sure you guys don't get anything. So in terms of process, each panelist will get five minutes. I am going to tap this glass at four minutes and it will be a speed round in comparison to the data discussion, which really gets into the specifics. This is gonna be a speed round and then we'll shift over to questions. So first up, we have, thank you so much, Deputy Secretary of State Lauren Hibbert here. And oh, also both of these are on. We will have to share them and pass them. So you will have five minutes. Well, I'm going to use my five minutes to just say thank you so much for inviting the Vermont Secretary of State. And um, Sarah Copeland Hansis is out of the country um, on her 30 year wedding anniversary. And we have a video um, from her. And I will be available to answer any questions uh, when we get to that portion of the section. Hi folks, I'm sorry I can't be with you in person. I am Secretary of State Sarah Copeland Hansis, and I am standing here along the Winooski River just behind my office on State Street. You can see the debris and the silt and the water line. You know, Toni Morrison wrote, you know they straightened out the river in places to make room for houses and livable acreage. Occasionally the river floods these places. Floods is the word they use. But in fact, it's not flooding, it's remembering, remembering where it used to be. Well, we have a lot of work to do to clean up from the latest remembering. It's been a dark, difficult and frightening summer for so many of our neighbors in Vermont. But we have some deeper reckoning we need to do about our role in fueling these climate disasters. If there's anything this summer has driven home to me, it's that climate change is not a theoretical future that we can ignore out of concern for the cost of renewable energy or the challenge of resilience measures or the inconvenience of adaptation. Every single day this summer, I looked face to face at the devastating loss, the incredible cost of Kelly's lost home, the overwhelming challenge of Mary Kay's lost business, the word inconvenience is too trivial to describe the heart-wrenching sight of downtown Barrie or Ludlow or Johnson or Montpelier. Every couch and bed and dresser, every store fixture and every bit of inventory out of so many homes and businesses. 
the time to act on climate is now. Since I can't be with you in the room, it's difficult to know for sure, but I imagine many of you are my friends and allies who are not at all surprised to hear me say the words climate action now. I've been with you working alongside you on all these efforts for so many years. The Secretary of State's office is not necessarily what you think of when you think of a statewide climate hub. And some of you even suggested that I shouldn't run for the position for the loss of my voice in the Climate Solutions Caucus. If you were one of the folks who thought that, I hope to prove you wrong. Because what I said to my climate allies a year ago is that I happen to think Vermont needs to elect more leaders who wake up every day thinking about climate change. We don't have time to sit around and wait for other leadership, to wait for the head of another agency to do their part. And you know what? Free, fair, and safe elections are the best way for Vermonters to demand that our leaders act on climate. Young people get it. That's why I'm committed to civics in schools and voter engagement programs that will help every Vermonter use the democratic process to accomplish the things that are too big for any of us to do on our own. A mid-July morning, I woke up to drive to Londonderry. Gloves, boots, sunscreen, snacks, drinking water replenished. I was ready to put my back into flood cleanup. I was in the car picking silt from under my fingernails from a day shoveling mud at Dante's Market in Barrie and thinking about the tremendous losses that I had seen when it occurred to me every fossil fuel appliance and furnace that's replaced this summer is baking in 30 years of emissions and we can't afford that. There are many of you in this room who played a key part in the work that Vermont is doing to support the installation of less polluting alternatives. Some of you were already thinking the same thing I was before I called you that day. It's a long drive from my home to Londonderry, so I pitched this to everyone I could think of. And I was so proud to see Efficiency Vermont's rollout of the program last week. There's more we need to do. That's why I also penned an op-ed calling on the governor to support that Efficiency Vermont flood relief program, to direct his appointees to the Climate Council to shift into emergency response. I asked him to direct his agency of natural resources to be willing partners in the development of the clean heat standard and support legislation that ensures we get to 100% renewable electricity by the end of the decade. Before I sent out that piece, I sat down with the governor. I wanted to ask him one leader to another, one parent to another, to please consider treating climate action with the same focus, respect for science and sense of urgency he did in his COVID response and that we're putting into flood response this summer. Thanks to the hard work of allies in this room, we've accomplished one of those things. Let's keep the conversation up about the rest. Please ask this administration to put their gloves on and get to work on the 2030 climate plan, the renewable energy standard, clean heat, and treating climate like the emergency it is. I'm proud to give you a look at the work my agency is doing to make sure every shoulder is put to the wheel on this. The most logical nexus of the Secretary of State's Office to Climate Action is through our Office of Professional Regulation. We register residential contractors who do projects valued over $10,000 in Vermont homes. We've followed through with our promise to create a map so that Vermonters can find a contractor in their area. Next, we'll turn to our professionals in the industry to identify appropriate certifications that will show homeowners which contractors have specialized training in building efficiency and renewable energy, Vermont has building codes that help ensure our homes and commercial buildings are as efficient as possible, saving everyone on the cost of energy and emissions. Up until now, those codes are voluntary, which leaves many Vermonters with homes that leak heat in the winter and are increasingly difficult to keep comfortable in the extreme summer heat. The Secretary of State's office is the state agency sponsor of the Department of Energy grant for resilient and efficient building codes. And we're actively participating in the Act 47 study committee, which is looking at building code structure in Vermont. We need to empower Vermonters to build more efficient and greener homes and businesses. In an altered climate, weather events are going to be more extreme. The rivers will remember again and the costs and the challenges and the inconvenience of inaction are mounting. I'm happy to be with you today to pledge my commitment to doing everything in my power to mitigate future suffering by ending our reliance on fossil fuels. My deputy Lauren Hibbert is with you today on the panel and she'll be happy to answer any questions you have about our work. Thank you.
excellent uh, and what a what a pithy website sos.vermont um, so now we will pass the mic to our attorney general charity clark thank you so much it's really really wonderful to be here among friends on this incredibly important issue I, I wanted to begin by saying that um, in my estimation, I consider myself to be the most environmentally oriented attorney general in the country. Um, I know this for many reasons. One is uh, on Earth Day, the Democratic Attorneys General Association wanted to do a social media post about um, like all of us in nature. And so my team got a big chuckle when they <laughs> saw all the pictures of the other attorneys general in like standing next to a tree in their front yard in sneakers. And I understood the assignment and obviously sent a picture of myself in sub-zero zero temperatures on top of camel's hump in my winter gear. <laughs> and it was kind of, um, it was very Vermont. Um, but I also consider myself to be one of the most environmental uh, attorney generals we've had in Vermont history. And it's something that comes not only from my vision for Vermont and for how we're gonna use the attorney general's office, but also from my own personal ethic and my upbringing um, in Vermont. Obviously, my name is Charity, I'm from Vermont. I think you know I was raised by Vermont hippies and it really doesn't matter how high my heels get, that will always be true. Um, something that I really hope is that when I leave the Attorney General's office, part of my known legacy is the environmental work that I have done and that we've all done um, together. I, I want to introduce the um, director of my environmental unit is here, Laura Murphy. Uh, I like to bring Laura to things because she used to be a professor, so she always explains things perfectly. So um, if you have questions for me and I can't answer them, I know she'll be able to. But so what does this ethic mean when we look at what the priorities of the office are? The first priority for me is holding fossil fuel companies accountable. We have sued the four major fossil fuel companies using a greenwashing theory and the Consumer Protection Act. That case is ongoing. It's almost two years old. Um, we are only at the beginning because the bad guys wanted to fight about forum. They wanted to fight in federal court and we wanted to be in state court and that um, decision hasn't been made yet by the judge. It's been almost a year and, and so we're awaiting that decision. Um, a few people have asked me why haven't you sued on an environmental theory? Why just a greenwashing theory? And the reason why is because we're located in the Second Circuit Court of Appeals region. The Second Circuit, all the, all the federal um, courts are assigned to a circuit. We're in the Second Circuit with Connecticut and New York. And there's bad precedent in the Second Circuit on the issue of bringing an environmental case against fossil fuel companies for climate change. There is a case right now um, in the Second Circuit uh, involving Connecticut and we are closely monitoring that case to see what happens and um, maybe there's hope for us. Uh, last week or the week before California sued on an environmental theory in the Ninth Circuit, they're not in the Second Circuit, um, and so we're monitoring that case as well to see if there is some future where that's an action that we can take. But for now we have our greenwashing case that we're working really hard on. The second um, item I want to raise is we, of course, are consumer experts at the Attorney General's office. I'm sure you all are aware of our consumer assistance program. And we kind of pride ourselves on our understanding of consumer behavior in addition to consumer law. And so we have created a climate-friendly consumer initiative to help educate consumers about climate-friendly products and services available to them to amplify the work being done already by many of you in this room but also to identify places where there isn't a voice yet. Um, and we have a small business advocate and a, um, a home improvement specialist who can help not just the consumers, but also the workers who are installing our heat pumps, et cetera, because we want to make sure there's a workforce there. Um, I see I'm getting a, a clink on a glass, so I'm, gonna, I'm not going to take the, uh, the full uh, Sarah Copeland Hansis minutes that she in, indulged in, <laughs> I'll keep it moving, but a couple other things. We also get involved on the multi-state level. So we involve ourselves in cases and amicus briefs, comment letters and such on the na national level to make sure that Vermont's voice is heard. And something that happens in another state, of course, affects us, but 
I think it's no, no more apparent than in the environmental space that that's true. We currently have over 30 cases, active cases, happening on the national level and over 30 amicus briefs and, and comment letters and such. So we will continue to do that work as well. In addition, we always are supportive of the climate action plan. The clean heat standard is something I, um, you know, I was pleased to support in the legislature and I'm thrilled that it is now law and we'll continue to work on the other elements of the climate action plan and make sure we, we show up to support the work being, um, being done to implement that plan. And finally, uh, the office is in the process of creating a climate friendly office plan where we are instituting policies that um, reflect our values when it comes to climate. Some of those are really inspired by the few pages in the climate action plan that are kind of what can you do as an individual. So we're creating that plan to make sure that even things like when we have a lunch, let's have it be vegetarian. Um, and thinking about, I had to go to a conference a month ago and when I got my state fleet vehicle, it was a hybrid and I said, can I get a hybrid plug in? That would be better for the environment. So we're working on that as well and it, it feels really good to be creative internally and, and with all of, of you and the work that you're doing as well. So thanks again for having me. I'm looking forward to the conversation. Thank you. And I apologize that I did not click for our Secretary of State, but I wasn't sure it would make any difference with the video. So uh, next up, we have Lieutenant Governor David Zuckerman. Thank you, everybody. And um, the, the picture behind me uh, exemplifies a bit of my philosophy that's uh, oats and peas cover crop, which agriculture was one of the topics earlier that was shown in terms of uh, the environment and one of the big possibilities I think in carbon sequestration is actually around cover crops and agriculture. So I just want to state, I think there's real potential there, low tech, high return, and actually builds the soil and has a lot of other environmentally beneficial uh, opportunities. And I just point out that I, I chose to be a farmer as I studied environmental studies at University of Vermont, because in part, seeing that as a sector of our society, it was one of the largest polluters uh, water quality is impacted, uh, soil degradation, and carbon emissions. Uh, and so I've been sort of living my environmental philosophy and ethic since before I got involved in politics. Uh, when it comes to policies and so forth, I'm going to leave that to some of the legislative leaders for the coming session, uh, in part because I'm going to throw out a few ideas that are maybe a few years down the line, um, which is a bit of how I've operated for many years on many issues is promoting ideas and promulgating ideas that maybe need some more work to get there, but thinking in that slightly longer uh, framework than the immediate. Uh, I will say in the immediate relative to Secretary of State's work, um, I've been doing a book banning tour or book banned books are books worth reading tour, not book banning, um, to, uh, for a number of reasons, but part of which is around democracy. Because without uh, an informed and broadly critical thinking society, which is what books and information help us all become, uh, we have a real unfortunate um, path that I think our country is going on and some people would like to see, which is a narrower set of thinking and even potentially a breakdown of democracy towards a more authoritarian system. And if we go down any of those paths, I think many of our collective efforts on the environment uh, can be kissed goodbye. So um, to me, the, the banned books are books worth reading tour is, is related to democracy, which is fundamentally related to our environmental future. Um, some of the uh, topics that I really think we need to be looking at is housing, not just envelope and heating, but also scale and use. We have 56 to 58,000 second homes in our state, and we have folks who are unhoused. We have folks that um, have second, third, and fourth homes, which is a huge environmental impact relative to people having a first home to live in. So are there possibilities to have a progressive uh, third set of property tax uh, t uh, definitions to both get resources from folks who have second homes, both Vermonters and others, to put into affordable housing, weatherization, and other uh, progressive economic and environmental opportunities. I think this is a discussion that we will have moving forward, or I hope we'll have. Um, additionally, have people thought about whether property tax could be based on per capita occupancy or density in housing? You know, we have some really big houses with really few people. 
That's not an environmental outcome. It's not a social outcome. If we look at a more progressive system of taxation with respect to people per square foot in a house, might encourage folks to rent out a room in their house or uh, live with, with things like home share that some of you know Kirby Dunn did a lot of work on. Um, and I just want to also offer that uh, with more housing and more opportunities for housing, we would have more opportunities for folks to join that workforce that we are seeing a really difficult uh, time filling in the energy field from installation to maintenance, uh, as we saw in the charts with the earlier conversation. Um, I want to uh, also point out that uh, I think the Finance Committee in the Senate or Ways and Means in the House uh, are some of the most important committees when it comes to uh, environment and policy in general. Uh, I was told when I first got to the legislature uh, many years ago that I should try to get on Ways and Means because tax policy is policy, whether it's energy incentives and it's how much money do we have to then put into uh, issues like resiliency, culverts, housing, weatherization. And I'll finally close uh, with another idea which is around hemp and hempcrete, which is also related to agriculture as we see farms transitioning to potentially be another carbon sequester that could then be used in housing and energy efficiency. And lastly, because my time is up in 10 seconds, I also work hard to amplify messages. So if you have issues and ideas you want amplified, I put out a newsletter. There's a clipboard over there by my friend assistant, Lewis Porter. It's going to go around the room um, for uh, you to sign up for if you'd like. But also, if you want issues amplified, please reach out to my office so we can build that, uh, build that energy for the future. Thank you. Thank you, Lieutenant Governor. So far, you win the award for timeliness. No offense. <laughs> uh, and hello, Treasurer. I'm going to let you take a seat and uh, take a breath, um, even though technically you should be up next. Uh, so we're going to shift over to Senator Bray, who is the chair of Senate Natural Resources and Energy Committee. Uh, good morning, everyone. It's great to be back at the AAN conference. It's always a great day of, or great days of learning. Um, the challenges we're talking about are so profound that I want to just pause and think about, I think about for myself, and I hope all of us will think about how we orient ourselves to the work. And um, for a theme, I'll start with a, a Mario Cuomo quote. We campaign in poetry, but we govern in prose. And um, so as legislators on the panel talk about what's coming for the, uh, the coming session, um, I think that's going to be, some of that will be the pros, but how do we, how do we each of us come to that work? And for me, I have uh, a family background uh, in, their members of my family are from the clergy and also mainly doctors, five physicians. So I grew up around people who were interested in healing, and I think that's the frame of mind I inherited coming into it. Um, my father said, you know, um, we doctors help people, but patients do all their own healing. So if I carry that, uh, and that is the truth, all the healing happens within you, doctors might help you uh, facilitate what the work that your body can do, and only your body can do. The same thing occurs to me when we talk about nature and climate change. The, um, we need to help nature heal itself, not continue on sort of a hubristic path that says, we are going to go out and fix nature. You know, uh, In part, I'm hoping that we will uh, look in our work to stop abusing the natural system we live in um, and uh, focus more on how we can support uh, natural systems in their healing. So um, if we move away from sort of an abusive relationship to a respectful, healthy use, a healing relationship, you know, what kind of questions come up? Um, uh, and uh, they're not just uh, things for our minds. There's a lot of great minds in this room. There are also a lot of great hearts. And I don't think we often talk about bringing our hearts to the work. Um, so what is healthy? What is kind? What is respectful? What is loving? And I'm going to pause on that word love. I think uh, me and probably everyone else is used to talking and learning about uh, MMBTUCO2Es, you know? <laughs> We're pretty good on that stuff. But bringing a loving heart to the challenges in front of us, that makes me and probably a lot of people a little more uncomfortable or squeamish. So I want to 
just feel that, hold that, and help us remember to keep bringing that to the work ahead. So for the, the first thing I want to talk about in terms of uh, the pros part, a legislative um, plan of action, um, back in 2020, I had introduced a, um, a constitutional amendment to create a right to clean air, water, and land that is a healthy environment. COVID derailed that, um, and I'll be reintroducing that along with many colleagues um, this January. Um, because that provides the, the legal foundation for that healthy, loving, supportive relationship with the natural world that we're in. Secondly, the Affordable Heat Act. Um, it was a big lift to get that to where it is, but it's only the first of at least two lifts, you know? Um, so I wanna avoid the legislative um, predisposition to bright shiny object syndrome. We passed the Affordable Heat Act, it's just begun. We need to lean into it and make sure that we keep following it and make sure that we learn as much as we can to support it so that in the 2025-26 session, we can um, translate that blueprint into an operational program that really addresses many of the challenges we looked at up on the, on the great slides we went through this morning. The third thing I want to talk about is the renewable energy standard. I was happy to work with others on passing that in 2015, but it's time for what some people are calling the RES 2.0. Yes, we have the cleanest grid in the United States. Yes, there's, uh, that helps create, put um, genuine, gives genuine meaning to the notion of beneficial electrification, but we're still roughly one third, um, you know, not bound by law to be renewable, and then what do we mean by clean? So there's a deep discussion there uh, to be had and worked through. The, the next thing I wanna say is that 100% um, clean grid means is an equity uh, element. It means that everyone, regardless of their um, wealth or location, has the ability to flip the switch and get clean energy. Uh, my time is running out, or maybe it is out. I'm going to just mention a couple more things very briefly. We need to come back to climate resilience work. Post-Irene, we learned a lot. We did a lot of good things. Um, we need to uh, re-examine what we did, re-examine gaps, and look at um, modifications to take us forward. Um, we heard about uh, building energy standards. I'm working with others and chairing a group right now that looks at uh, making the renewable building energy standards and commercial building energy standards um, more deeply implemented. We use them, but not enough in the state of Vermont. Um, and it's the biggest investment anyone ever makes for most people, their home, and it has a very long-term uh, environmental um, implications. So with that, I started with uh, Cuomo and campaign and poetry, govern and prose. Um, I'd say, you know, let's let's campaign with a vision of deep health and let's govern as healers and with humility. Thank you very much. Thank you, Senator. And uh, I think uh, we'll just continue along the line. So we will move over to the chair of House Transportation, Representative Sarah Coffey, and then next will be Representative Sheldon and we'll close up with State Treasurer Mike Pichak. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? I'm holding this because, great. It's a pleasure to be here um, today with all of you. I feel like there's so much knowledge and experience in this room. So I'm Sarah Coffey. I serve in the House and I represent two small communities in the southeastern corner of the state. Both uh, are farming communities um, and one has been the host community for the Vermont Yankee nuclear power plant. So. Um, I come to this work, I carry those voices with me into the work as well, because I'm just as concerned for our rural communities, that, especially in the transportation sector where um, we have to drive a whole lot. So one, I'll just to give you some context, the, the, what I love about the transportation committee is we're both a money committee and a policy committee. So what that means is that we get to make these decisions that are in step with one another. And so 
because we all know, we can recognize in this room that to do this work, we need money to do a lot of this work as well. So we want to make sure that our policy is connected um, uh, with our money decisions. And before I go on much further, I'm really happy that a member of our committee is here today, Representative um, uh, Scott Campbell from, um, from uh, St. Johnsbury. Um, and it's been an exciting first year. This has my, been my first year um, as the chair. But I think um, in terms of our priorities, I think this summer has really set the stage for our work and offers a tremendous opportunity for us to work together between the flooding, the hazy skies that we had because of the fires in Canada, the soggy summer that we've had, the extreme heat in other parts of the country. I mean, I think there is no more uh, of a reminder that it is necessary for us to take action and also at the same time build resiliency and at, at adaptivity within our communities. So these are the three things that are gonna be driving um, my priorities in our committee this session. And I have to say we have a very climate positive committee in the house, which I'm, for which I'm very grateful. Um, and as folks know, I, this slide I wanted to show, because this is, I feel like is a terrifying <laughs> slide. And it's the thing that I, between that and this, my dog-eared copy of the Climate Action Plan from 2021 are the things that kind of I try to use to ground me in our work. Because we know the transportation sector um, is a huge contributor to our greenhouse gas emissions in, in, in Vermont. Um, and through the Global Warming Solutions Act, we set some really aggressive targets. Um, and they're ambitious. And I think what we're starting to hear is that we might be falling short. So what do we do? Um, similar to what's going on uh, at the international level, like we have some real challenges. And I'm, you know, I come to this work in the legislature from the performing arts. And you might say, why would, you know, what expertise do I have in this work? But we're, the performing arts field is highly collaborative. And I think for us to tackle this work, we need to have collaboration between um, our committees in the House, in the Senate, um, the administration, um, the Agency of Transportation. Um, we're working closely with the community development folks within the office of the ACCD. And we're gonna be needing to work with the energy sector and businesses and so on and so forth in order for us to make, uh, make this successful. So I stand on the shoulders of some terrific people who came before me. We, d we made some really great investments um, in, um, in transportation with the EV programs. And we know that EV adoption in Vermont is key to us um, uh, reaching our goals, but it's not the only thing. So just a few things that we did this past session is that we, um, uh, we created these programs in statute, so which is a, a signal, a strong signal that we're gonna continue to fund these programs. Um, and I think the challenge is, is how are we doing? Uh, we're doing a lot of assessment and we're gonna continue to do that. It's like, what, is, what are the barriers to, for people to adopt uh, an EV? You know, what are folks in the Northeast Kingdom, are they having as equitable access with the, you know, the transformers and the powers to their homes, right? You're saying no, we're hearing about some of that. And how do we make that equitable access? Um, so I think EV adoption and um, getting people out of their cars, um, their single occupancy cars, so what we do with um, public transportation and innovation in that space, um, and to electrify our fleets. A huge challenge is gonna be about freight delivery, how we do that. It's, uh, it's, and I think we need to be thinking about hydrogen, fuel, and, and, and more so that we diversify the transportation space. But, all of these decisions need to be driven by data, and we're gonna be getting a report um, in November, mid-November, the carbon reduction strategy. I know the members of the Climate Council got a preview of that, um, and I know more they're taking uh, input, and I'm, I do think that that is gonna be really important for us. So we're looking forward to that final draft, but also in, uh, we need to be looking at other solutions clearly, and our committee is gonna be uh, has a, has a bit of a daunting task, I think, this session, but I think by working together and getting us rowing in the same direction um, will be really key to our work. So thank you again, and I look forward to questions afterwards. Thank you, Chair. Next up, we have another chair, Representative Amy Sheldon uh, from the House Environment and Energy Committee. Thank you. It's a great pleasure to be here this morning. 
And I want to just take a second to recognize that Gabrielle is uh, also on the House Environment and Energy Committee, and we have another member of the committee here, Dara Tori. So feel free to um, grab them and talk to them about what's happening in our committee later on. So I also was hoping my, maybe I would be last because I was going to make a comment about Mother Nature Bats last. And I really appreciate that we're here at EAN and your report just came out. And so much of what this important work does is ground us in the reality that um, we, we, we have a the existential threats that we face today need to also be faced with efficacy and integrity and maintaining that as a high standard as we move forward, even as a little state will be key to our role in helping the nation and the world address climate. I guess um, I start this conversation or this chair, this position I sit in as chair um, with a deep understanding that there are um, multiple crises that we're facing and they're all integrally related. We have a human health crisis, we have a biodiversity crisis, and we have a climate crisis. And the human health crisis is a, is a mental, physical, and spiritual crisis that can mostly, I, by, I strongly believe, be addressed by reintegrating our economy and ourselves with nature. Secondly, we have a biodiversity crisis, which is a conflagration of our mismanagement of, of this earth, and we have a responsibility to address it. It's two big things. Um, many people know the IPCC talks about the million species we're at risk of losing imminently, um, but additionally, it's an abundance crisis. Since 1970, most species, not all, there's been a few successes, but most species have declined by 70%. Finally, the climate crisis. Many have articulated and shown on video well um, that it couldn't be more clear now. After a summer of extremes and catastrophes, our state started in a near drought, or some, some counties, I believe, were in a drought and quickly toggled to um, flooding that affected many of us in different ways um, and uniquely compared to Tropical Storm Irene. So it couldn't be more clear and the time is ripe for us to double down. I know like this is preaching to the choir, you're all here because you've already been doing all this great work. We've done great work and we can do better and we can raise the bar for ourselves along the way. So um, our priorities for the session, I think it's really important for us thinking holistically to realize they're not either or decisions we're making, but they have to be both and situation that we're in. Um, and I think thinking about the multiple benefits we get when we do good work, addressing all of those challenges before us is a place for where, where we will start the conversation. Another one, which the EAN report, which frankly, you know, I read this last night because I just got it in the mail like all of you. And um, it, it, if it doesn't hit you over the head that we in the United States consume more than our share of resources, including energy, um, we need to start with conver conservation and reminding ourselves that our individual actions add up and they drive the market. And I think it's important for us to, to continue to understand that and share that information. I know together we can do more, but individually we can do a lot. And remembering that conservation um, is, is really, really key. Um, I think that Last session, we passed a really important bill, H-126, which is the Community Resilience and Biodiversity Protection Act. It is now a model for the rest of the country and potentially the world. We worked hard to have a really high focus on biodiversity and set a, set a standard. We've done that um, with the Affordable Heat Act. I believe other states are already looking to us as a model and enacting similar legislation. And we can do that again as we look to updating the renewable energy standard. That work is many of the folks are, um, in this room are engaged in our stakeholder group. We've had two meetings. We're about to have a third. So it's kind of underway. It's a little premature to predict where that's going. Um, but it will be informed by the data. And um, it will address and improve and raise the bar again. We have an opportunity there. Um, in our committee, we're um, going to be looking at like I said, the frame is community resilience and biodiversity protection. We have a, probably five studies out there that are going to inform land use and land use regulation. And I go back to the holistic approach when we talk about updating our statewide land use regulations and supporting our planning community so that our communities can address those crises 
simultaneously, um, we think about how does our built environment um, make sure that every Vermonter has a connection to nature where they live so that they can actually walk and explore and be in nature without getting in their cars. So that, that's, that's the smaller picture. The other picture is following through on implementation of the Community Resilience and Biodiversity Protection Act. It's again, it's a, it's a phased thing. There'll be information coming back to us, making sure that future legislators fund the conservation work that's necessary. Um, and I guess with that, I will, I will hold and pass the mic um, to Mike. Thank you all. Thank you, Chair. Next, Secretary, uh, no, Treasurer Mike Pichak. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gabrielle. And thank you, everybody, for, for having us. Thank you for having me. Thank you for all the work that you do in the energy and climate space. It's really a critical issue, as we've heard today from the panel, and I'm sure you're hearing today and tomorrow. You know, I just to start broad and then to go more narrow about what our office is doing in the space of, of energy and climate, you know, I view Vermont's future as being very optimistic um, from all angles. And one of the reasons I have that optimism is, is, the, is coming out of the COVID-19 pandemic. You know, going into the pandemic, we had our share of economic challenges, of demographic challenges, but the pandemic really uh, split this geographic tie between where you work and where you live. And I think the pandemic also made everyone reevaluate how they want to live their lives, where they want to live their lives, what they want to put their energy and time into. And I think there's a great opportunity for Vermont to capitalize on that, to make some of our challenges prior to the pandemic actually our strengths, like our outdoor natural beauty, our outdoor recreation economy, the desire for people to want to work and live here remotely. So we have a really tremendous opportunity ahead of us. But one of the things that I think is the greatest threat to materializing on that is how we respond to climate change as it relates to Vermont and the resiliency of our state. We saw it just in July. Uh, so many of our communities were impacted really significantly. And in Irene, there were different communities that were impacted. And in the next storm, there'll be different communities. So our, our real challenge is to try to figure out not just how to build back more resiliently, which is a challenge, but an even bigger challenge will be figuring out how to get ahead of the next uh, severe weather event so that we don't experience the same kind of devastation and the same kind of damage and that we continue to be a spot that people want to move to, view as being relatively climate safe compared to other parts of the country. Uh, and I think that will carry over into a whole host of benefits uh, for the state. So I'm very optimistic about our future, but I really think of climate resiliency as being one of the key challenges that faces us uh, square ahead. And it's something that we can't solve overnight. We're gonna have to have a sustained effort uh, to do it. So in terms of our office and what we've been doing to work on climate, um, a couple of things just to mention, uh, we've been working with the Department of uh, Buildings and Grounds to make sure that they have the flexibility that they need uh, to operate the state energy management program. So the treasurer's office provides funds to that program for the efficiency of state buildings. It's been a program that's worked with great success. Um, they needed some more flexibility in, in terms of uh, tackling some of the bigger projects for the state, and we've agreed to provide that flexibility, and I think it's really gonna be a mutually beneficial relationship. The treasurer's office provides the funds, they use the funds to do the energy efficiency projects, and the state makes money basically in the long run by those energy savings. We've also expanded this program called 10% in Vermont, and we focused on housing, energy act, climate action, and then social equity goals. Uh, we announced the first round of that 10% money, 55 and a half million for housing. Uh, this is affordable housing. Uh, I think housing is a big component of our sort of energy and climate future too. We need to build smartly and build densely to uh, have uh, some of the, you know, to mitigate some of the worst impacts of, of climate and, and climate uh, disaster. Um, but also we need to now focus on how do we support with this 10% uh, Vermont program, municipalities for infrastructure, energy projects, and the like. And uh, after that first 55 and a half million investment that we announced last week, that's where we're turning our attention to uh, as well, uh, this 10% in Vermont program. Another thing that I wanna mention, and maybe we have it up on the screen, uh, is work that we're engaging in at the direction of the legislature, which we're really excited about, uh, which is looking at how do we finance our climate infrastructure in the future. 
One way to do that or a way to think about this more tangibly is that a lot of states have designated an entity or created an entity in their state to be their state's green bank, to sort of be the collaborator, the point person, the entity that um, is leveraging philanthropic dollars, state dollars, federal dollars, and then putting those to use for the priorities relating to climate. So we're engaging in that work. November 3rd is a, a date that we've asked for comment letters. Uh, we'd encourage everyone that's interested in this topic uh, in the room uh, to go to our website. We'll have some questions there that will sort of facilitate the comment letter, but we're asking for those by November 3rd. And then we're also planning to have stakeholder meetings on October 24th, October 27th, and October 30th. Those will all be at 9.30 in the morning, and we're going to break those out topically by energy, business and finance, public uh, agencies, municipalities, and then natural and working lands. And we'll have more information about that on our website and also publicly uh, through email uh, and, uh, and a press release uh, as well. And then just the last thing I want to mention, because I see Beth and she'll probably, uh, you know, want me to make sure that I talked about this because she, she reached out to me and made a good point. Um, there's a bill, S-42, uh, that's working its way uh, through the uh, House and, and the Senate um, it's a bill that would be focusing on fossil fuel, di fuel divestment from our state uh, pension funds. Um, and I just want to thank the folks from Third Act because they brought this early last session. Um, but they've also been very open to hearing the ways to do it, in my opinion, appropriately and correct. And they've been a great partner in trying to, to navigate a compromise on a bill, uh, which is a bill that I supported once we got to the compromise. Uh, the first thing as treasurer is to do no harm to the pension system. Uh, I don't believe this bill does that. Uh, but then you also need to look at the financial risk of investing in fossil fuels over the short, medium, and long term. And I think this bill creates a framework to do just that and to reduce our risk uh, over time. So I'd encourage you to look at that bill, ask our office or ask myself if you have any questions about it. Uh, but again, very honored to be here today and look forward to your questions. Thank you, Treasurer. And I just want to highlight there was a comment uh, in Slido thanking you all, uh, and in particular for not just talking about MMBTUs uh, and KWHs, but talking about um, the, the human uh, element of this challenge at hand, because certainly we will not get through this without working together. So uh, the winning question thus far is how are you and I'm trying to figure out how to answer that one, working with your counterparts in the region to expand emissions reductions via a multi-state carbon market. Uh, one of the top recommendations in the Climate Action Plan was to join the Transportation Climate Initiative, which did not move forward. There are different opinions as to um, whether or not we could enter a cap and invest uh, program. Uh, if another, you know, if there was one up and running or whether or not we would need legislative authority. So I guess uh, I'll start with, I'll start with Senator Bray. Um, what your thoughts are given that New York has a uh, cap and invest program they're working on. There's also a transportation fuel standard and then we can go to Chair Coffey. Um, so thanks for the question. Uh, I think probably everyone is aware of the TCI history uh, in terms of trying to build a stronger program by bonding together. We already did this on Reggie, which has operated effectively for 20 years, uh, so much so that few people are even aware that there's a price on carbon built into, the electric into electricity. Um, the Affordable Heat Act aims to do a, a similar thing for fossil fuels. Uh, Oregon is a model of where we see the same kind of thing happening on transportation fuels. Um, the, the closest point of contact I see to make immediate progress is in the uh, RES, where we're looking at what do we mean by clean, uh, amongst other things. So renewable energy certificates or credits, RECs, uh, flow to different forms of generation. Uh, which forms do you, how do you define clean in such a way that you drive, um, you help shape the marketplace in a way that is both uh, promotes projects that we want to favor uh, because of their benefits as well as uh, reaching out to our neighboring states that also have definitions of clean energy in the rec marketplace. So 
there's, um, that's a, a really short high level answer, but I think we could have a, an all day discussion about uh, this one. Great, great. So um, I think I'll speak to it from the transportation um, space. Uh, um, New York State is is looking is starting a cap and invest program, and I think I think one of the things that we're going to be needing to hear about is uh, more about that program and whether Vermont there there's openness to, for Vermont to join that program. I'm a strong believer that this is we need to find regional solutions um, to these to these problems, and I think that is one such possibility. I also in, in August I attended the. Uh, National Caucus of Environmental Legislators, and it was total, truly inspiring to see what's going on in that space across states. Because I think with the logjam at the federal level, like the the future and the possibility is really strongly believed to be at the state level. And so um, I'm, it's exciting. I got to meet a lot of other chairs of transportation committees, which was really great. Um, and to see what other states are doing. Cause I think while the New York state is a real, it's right next door, it's there. I think there might also be some other levers that, um, that we need to be looking at. And like I said, at this carbon reduction strategy that we're going to be getting, I hope will help pave the way. And I look forward to working with the administration on this. This is something that's going to require uh, us working together. So. Um, one other thing I wanted to just add in, um, it was the sixth thing on my list of things I hope we work on this coming session, and it is to find long-term sustainable funding. Um, so right now we're enjoying an unprecedented surge of federal dollars, it's letting us step programs up, but we don't want to launch programs that then sail off a funding cliff. And so these sorts of programs, especially when they have the strength of being regional, means that we can create, just like the Reggie program did, long-term sustainable funding to make sustainable gains uh, without throwing the whole energy industry, which is very much interested in participating, through a roller coaster ride. Uh, sure. Just one more thing. I, I know that this afternoon we're going to be hearing from Andrea Wright and others. I think when we get this climate strategy plan together, it can open up some other federal dollars. But I do think we need... We can't rely only on federal grants to do this work. We're going to need we're going to need state initiatives as well to do a lot of this work. Well, and as someone who filled out that survey, it was interesting to me to note uh, this is the survey from VTrans. It was interesting for me to note that the number that that the greatest way we could reduce emissions was through joining a cap and invest program. Um, but uh, did anyone on the panel want to comment on this question uh, before I move on to the next question? I just wanted to briefly mention that as we look at renewable energy and renewable energy standards, we also have to somehow break down the idea that we have to export that production. Uh, we have to have more of that production in state. We've, we've put up a lot of hurdles in the last number of years around particularly wind turbines, but also some aspects of solar, larger solar. Uh, we can we can and should do that in our own backyards as well. Okay, uh, the next winning question, although it's a bit of a segue, but maybe that's a good thing, is what ideas do you have to reduce the cost pressures on electric rate payers, parentheses, encourage beneficial electrification, energy equity, investment in grid resiliency? Who would like to take an First stab at this. Well, I'll, I'll say a little something since I'm, uh, we've, we, this is really a follow on to the, our discussion just leading in. So, uh, you know, we talk about beneficial electric. Uh, thank you. Um, the, the, I'm, I just want to, the, the conversation we've been having already up here in Q and A, it leads right into this one. So what do we, when we talk about the RES, it's a really, a, it's a plan for uh, creating cleaner energy, but we need to redefine, you know, we need to make the term beneficial electrification truly meaningful by making sure that the supply that people are drawing on is actually um, clean energy. And we'll, again, there's a deeper discussion about how we define it. It has financial implications and for the near term and the long term. Um, so I think for me that is, uh, and it also has equity um, implications. So again, we've counted a lot in Vermont on energy pioneers to do the work, for instance, net metering. 
Um, but we're also interested in making sure that uh, everyone in Vermont participates in an equal footing. We talked, we saw earlier this morning the energy burden uh, information that shows that costs and the benefits of uh, a clean energy economy aren't being equally felt. So um, looking more broadly at standards, including long-term funding mechanisms, um, we need to get the, the pros right behind the, the more uh, poetic vision of having a more just uh, society. Um, I, I guess in the interest of where I, where I talked a little bit about was, um, you know, we, we hear about the increased costs that come from renewables, and I think that, that there's a case to be made there, but there's also a case to be made for the cost of them coming down. So we're open to learning about the actual costs of, the, of increasing our reliance on them. Um, and additionally, I'm actually looking forward to the outcome from the lawsuit. <laughs> um, and I hope it's in our favor. And I think that there's an appropriate use um, there if, it, if it's a positive outcome that the companies that convince the American public um, to hold off on action on climate should help us transition to um, a cleaner grid for all. I'm going to take uh, the moderator's uh, right to ask our chief finance guy at the panel. We have a lot of questions here about how are we gonna make sure we harness IRA dollars. Uh, we've had questions or, or a couple of comments about the fact that we can't just look at federal dollars. What, what ideas do you have to actually really figure out that yes, we harness federal dollars, but also, you know, what are the tools in the toolbox to make sure we can leverage whatever we can and then bring it home, particularly uh, in mind that a lot of Vermonters are very risk adverse in terms of debt. So unless it's a 0% loan, uh, a lot of Vermonters might not even sign up. Yeah, well, it, it I think, you know, just to go back to that first point, that was just that question that Andrea asked, you know, um, and I think it goes into your point too, Gabrielle, because it's this work that we're doing right now to sort of evaluate, you know, what is the financing entity or what are the financing entities or what is the collaborative structure that works best for Vermont? And I think both in terms of expanding uh, the beneficial electric grid and benefiting ratepayers equally and taking pressure off, a lot of that opportunity does lie with the IRA and money that's available. So we do have to make sure we're getting all of our you know, fair share of that money uh, and not leaving anything on the table. So I think that's, that's definitely number one. Um, but in terms of this, you know, this process that we're going through, what I hope it will reveal is how do we combine all of the beneficial things that are happening you know, like that Rob Miller is working on, uh, that the private sector is working on, that different agencies are, are working on, uh, and make sure we're, we're collaborating with each other to get the best kind of outcomes. So I think the resources are, you know, private, philanthropic, federal, and then there's state too. So what are some other ideas to bring, you know, money to the state for this? You know, I do think there are potential, I don't want to give them away here, but there are things that we're thinking about that, would draw on um, entities that do business in Vermont, that have significant capital in Vermont, and how can we get them to invest uh, in Vermont for climate resiliency and mitigation because it's in their own best interest as well in the long term. So I think we have to think creatively, but I think one of the biggest benefits we could get is making sure we're collaboratively thinking and prioritizing all of these different funding sources so that we're making the biggest impact. And, I, and again, I just encourage people to engage with us in this process for the next three months as we continue our work. Any other comments from panelists? So um, I just wanted to make sure that folks know one of the things that we did do this past session was we fenced off um, a significant amount of money so that we would for the next four years so that we would be able to leverage these, um, the IIJA and the IRA dollars. And that was not an easy lift. Um, we had to do some unpopular things, like to do that was to free up some money, like to raise DMV fees, which hadn't been raised since 2016. So, you know, but we did it, and now nobody's complaining that they're paying $5 more for their driver's license, $6 more for their driver's license. But I just want to say, we are working on that, but I think we do need to think beyond that horizon, the four-year horizon that we have with these, with these federal dollars that um, came out of Congress in the last few years. 
Um, also, uh, by way of encouragement, self-encouragement, um, I think about how uh, Efficiency Vermont. So if you look at Efficiency Vermont set up as a first statewide energy efficiency utility in 2000, you look at its first 20 years of operation, it raised bill by bill, contribution by contribution through the energy efficiency charge, um, $784 million. Those dollars were invested in uh, achieve lifetime savings of 2.8 billion. So roughly a four to one return. It's a, a, a great model. It now has become, again, a little bit like Reggie. It works so well, it sits in the background. We don't appreciate what a powerful tool it is. So the Affordable Heat Act, NOA, tries to imitate some of the, uh, the programmatic strategies for long-term funding that we've seen with Efficiency Vermont. Um, it's became a, a, a program that has been um, a model nationally and internationally. Rich Coward told me that the EU adopted, in essence, something very akin to the Vermont model for the entire European Union. So Vermont, uh, we, are, we are modest, but sometimes we have some pretty good ideas and we lean into them and make them work. I want to both express appreciation for the holding back of reserves, uh, Representative Coffey, but, but slightly push back a little bit in that uh, when I was campaigning last year, there were two different instances where working class people spoke to me about their frustrations with all of us in government who are trying to work on climate issues. One spoke up very much about the Affordable Heat Act. He didn't recognize who I was. He was pointing at my sign at my feet during a honk and wave going, this guy, this guy wants to tax, make me replace my heating system for $30,000. Where is someone like me supposed to come up with this money? And he railed on me for about two or three minutes and I listened and I extended my hand. I said, hi, I'm, I'm that guy. Um, and I said, but also I'm advocating that when we do, pro that, first of all, no one's forcing you to do anything in the Affordable Heat Act. Um, but there are incentives and support to help you do it. But secondly, the conversation around economic progressivity is something that I will be bringing up, and I have brought it up, and I will continue to bring it up, whether there's media in the room or not, to talk about progressive taxes. Because until we talk about this in a way that is going to be uh, cost beneficial, for a lot of people who are not in this room, if I can hazard a generality, uh, we are going to lose the public debate. And the second of those stories was at Thunder Road, and I'm walking along, and this guy goes, I know you, I hear you on the radio, I don't agree with anything you say, but at least you say what you believe. And I said, well, fair enough. And we got bantering back and forth, and this guy came up and said, one of his buddies, and held up as if he was holding a license plate. And he said, how come my license plate fees keep going up? And I said, well, I'll tell you why. Because ultimately, government has to be funded. And when you vote for people that say no taxes, no taxes, no taxes, you're going to see your fees go up and up and up. And one of the guys get, said, well, we know that's never going to happen. And I said, well, that's because bleepity bleeps like you keep buying it and voting for them. And they all laughed and chummed and got along as if we were around the, the bonfire having a beer. We've got to reach those people. And we've got to reach those people by talking about dealing with the environment in an economically just way. And an earlier slide pointed out that who's getting hit harder with their bills as a percentage of their income. So I'm a bit of a broken record, but I'm gonna come back to the economic disparity issue if we're gonna truly get to the bottom of the environmental consequences of our actions. Uh, thank you, Lieutenant Governor. I, I might say Vermont has one of the um, more progressive tax structures. Um, so I think, you know, uh, as someone who's uh, lobbied within the building, it can be challenging to talk about how do you make it even more progressive. But I, I appreciate your comments with regards to second, third, fourth uh, homeowners and opportunities there. I want to just highlight, we all know in this room, at least I think we all know that um, in the long run, if you weatherize your home and you shift to more affordable heating sources, you save money. The question is the upfront cost. And if we have Vermonters who do not uh, either have the ability because they, do, they have poor credit or they have no credit, and so they can't pay for that, or they're afraid, or they're 75, so why would they make that investment? I'm going to go back again to Treasurer Pichak. Um, like, what are the financing tools there so that we can apply that savings, those 10, 15, 20 year savings up front? Yeah, well, 
Well, I think, you know, obviously um, in this rate environment, low interest loans are going to be critical to making those kind of investments on individuals' home. Um, I think also thinking about how they can make those investments against the equity that they have in their homes too, uh, so that when they do sell their home or when they do pass it on, you know, it's more connected necessarily to the home than to that individual. I think that's one way of potentially trying to, you know, enhance uh, more opportunity. Um, I think there's also the need for, you know, grants too, for, you know, payments uh, for individuals, particularly low income individuals, because, you know, a lot of people don't want even a low interest rate loan. They have enough loans in their lives. Uh, and if they're going to make an investment like that on their property, then we need to, in the short term, subsidize them and subsidize that decision because, um, you know, it is a potentially a big, expensive upfront investment. So I think all of those things, I think thinking creatively about, you know, how to bend, how to take advantage of the equity in somebody's home, I think trying to think about low interest loans, trying to think about grant programs, and some of those things exist now, and you know, I think all of them probably want more resources and need more resources to be successful. Um, but, you know, and then part, I think a big part of it is education too, um, because it, it can be um, really challenging to, I think, understand or appreciate that that kind of investment that you make on day one, you know, how you see the benefit of it in year two, year five, year 10, and, and, and then maybe how, you know, the next generation of your family benefits from it, depending on, you know, where the house is going and all of that sort of thing. Um, so that's a big component, obviously, um, efficiency Vermont and the private sector and, and, and others are doing a lot of that great work. Um, but uh, certainly I think more resources from the state from the IRA, those are the things we're going to be looking at. So I'm going to go back to the top question, uh, and this is probably first and foremost to Chair Coffey. What appetite is there in the State House to rapidly expand public transport, bus, trains, municipal trams, etc., to help reach our climate goals? And relatedly, there was a question about uh, rail, which I am going to have to pull up later. Okay, find that real question. So I think there, um, this, it, over the past few years, um, the public transportation budget has gone from 17 million to 46 million. And, and our state is one of the states that is leading um, in, in our, our support of the public transportation um, sector. Um, but I have to say, it, it was acknowledged earlier, it is really challenging in our rural state to find public transportation models that work for, the, um, frankly, the, our low density. So we have, um, I think there is an appetite. Um, we are gonna be getting a report. We've been pretty creative in combining um, you know, Medicaid dollars, like this braided service to be able to fund um, public, our public transportation better, make it more accessible. I'm really concerned um, given that the amount of miles that rural Vermonters drive, how we can find some models that really can work for them. We have a MTI, which is the Mobility Transportation Initiative. This last session, we asked the agency to pull that out as a separate budget item from the public transportation budget so we could really see what's going on there. And I think we might need to be tweaking that program so that it's not just about capital investments, but it, the, right now there's kind of the feedback I've been hearing is that there's not the greatest incentive for groups to apply because it might be one-time funding. So um, uh, one project that came out of MTI grant funding um, is uh, a, a program, it's like essentially a rural Uber. Now, because, you know, we can't have buses running down. I, my, one of my towns has 80 miles of dirt road. Those big buses can't make it down. Yet this past year, last fall, I worked in our general store, and I worked with a young woman who lived nine miles away. And um, she got a ride in the morning, but she walked home um, every day. And our local, like Guilford Cares, couldn't organize to help her because she wasn't a senior and they serve seniors. Our, and the current programs that we had were not accessible to her. 
she had a decent house to live in, you know, but she lost her car. So anyway, I, th I think those are the things that I'm thinking very much about. And I do think that this um, program that came, that was birthed out of Capstone um, to do this kind of rural Uber, you, getting an electric fleet to do it, is something that is being piloted with by um, uh, Chris Cole, who's a former Secretary of Transportation, um, is, is leading that effort and it's, Ho we hope that it might be something that can be funded around the state. So the, the short answer is yes, there's an appetite. It always c bumps up against funding. And we ha Ross McDonald, who's the head of the program, has been very good at, it used to be 100% like, or almost 100% state dollars, and he's been really great at leveraging some federal dollars. Um, so yes. Uh, and two follow-ups. Uh, so w you mentioned a couple barriers, money, money, money. Um, but what are some of the other challenges to increasing active and shared transportation? What do you think the role of the legislature should be to address that? And then how do you envision us utilizing all of the existing rail lines to perhaps provide public transportation links in key community, key community corridors? What are the barriers and opportunities? So why don't I start with the rail one first? Um, we, uh, Rail is, we, we subsidize rail, Amtrak in Vermont, $9 million. Um, and that's because it does not make enough money. To, they would not be here unless we did that. Um, we have a, the state has a really good relationship with Amtrak, but the fact of the matter is, is that ridership in Massachusetts and Connecticut really drive what we can do in Vermont. Um, the Ethan Allen line has been such an exceptional addition, you know, kind of connecting Burlington to New York City up on the Rail Advisory Council. It's not, it's faster to drive to New York in your car, which is unfortunate. There's a lot of challenges about speeds and I can get into some of the technical information and Dan Delabrio can share more. But it is, we have a very rail positive committee um, that wants to do it. It takes um, the, the devastation of this flood on our railways is kind of mind boggling. Um, $70 million is the ticket price right now and it was kind of incredible how they were built back but they're not permanently built back um, and so I think we our rails are in our valleys along our waterways and I feel like they're they're vulnerable um, so I think yes can we do more do we want to do more yes I think it's really um, it's 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 a bit of a challenge um, and the other question was the Repeat, can you repeat it for me? The uh, yes. Uh, mon I, part of it was money, I th we think. Uh, we, uh, it always, comes back, it always comes back to money. I mean, we well, have we, to make... It, it does, yeah. but we, we, um, we can come back once I find sure. it. Yep. Um, so I'm going to uh, ask our Attorney General, we have two or three questions about lawsuits and I will let you start with your uh, preamble first that explained to me what your job was and what your role, but here are the questions. Is there a lawsuit because our state is not meeting our climate goals and what type would the state attorney play in that suit? So that's a first question. Uh, another question is, other AGs have signed a letter to the FTC advising that unbundled wrecks are deceptive and hurt renewability goals. Will the Vermont AG sign on? So the, I'm, I don't have a pen, so I'm gonna have to remember your questions. The, um, the state's attorney is not me. I'm the attorney general. The state's attorney is in every county and they are a criminal prosecutor for that county. So just that's, which is super confusing, but I just want to clarify that. The attorney general's main job is she is the lawyer to the state. So state wants to bring a lawsuit, attorney general can do that. State gets sued, attorney general defends the lawsuit. So if the state is sued, I will defend the lawsuit. When it comes to the Global Warming Solutions Act, I don't perceive the mechanism of the lawsuit as being the most efficient and speedy way of meeting our climate goals. And I, I think that's the general philosophy. The best thing we can be doing to meet our climate goals is what we're doing right now. We're meeting together, we're collaborating, we're talking to each other. This panel has been so impressive. I think Vermonters who hear how knowledgeable our leaders are will feel assured um, that we are on track. 
to be making, um, meeting our climate goals. But um, so that's the answer to that question. I feel like I missed your last question. Oh, the Rex question. So we have a process we follow for signing on to letters and multi-state lawsuits and whatnot. So I, Laura and I will, can look into that and I will, maybe I'll post it on my social media to answer your question. I don't have the question right now, but I'll answer it um, when I get back to the office. Thank you. And then there's a third one for you, the science behind linking individual emitters to climate damages has vastly improved in recent years, but is not well leveraged in litigation. Any thoughts? So as a sort of principle, um, I believe in the polluter pays model and, and like that approach. But what, what my goal is, is to bring a lawsuit that's going to be effective. So we make sure we know what the lawsuits are that are out there to help guide us on how we can craft our own lawsuit to be most effective at achieving our goal of holding those polluters accountable and ultimately um, getting money to help address the problems that they created. So that's our approach to doing that. Um, when there's not a lot of uh, lawsuits there, it uh, you know, can mean a few different things. Um, but that's one thing that we're always very strategic about. If you have concerns or want us to, you know, join a lawsuit or bring a lawsuit, you know, please contact the office. What I suspect is usually happening in those uh, situations is we are perfectly aware of the problem and we're kind of being strategic and um, uh, thoughtful about how and when we take action. Thank you. So the next top question, is there any appetite in the legislature to amend the permitting policies that are preventing wind development in the state. And I will just give some caveat that uh, I remember in a couple of jobs ago for me, it was our Lieutenant Governor who had a, was a Senator at the time who managed to prevent wind moratorium language from going into statute. What ended up happening, um, for any of you who doesn't live and breathe wind energy, is we now have sound regulations uh, that make it, um, uh, if you speak to a lot of wind developers, pretty much impossible to, uh, uh, to build uh, and permit a wind project. So, uh, Chair Bray, uh, Chair Sheldon, would you, you guys would be the two committees uh, that would have this come into your committee. Do you think there's any uh, appetite to address this? Um, sh sure. I don't think it's a front and center issue. I think it'll probably come up as we look at the renewable energy standard. Um, I, I haven't I've been overwhelmed by it. I think folks have, uh, there's been a pause and, you know, I guess we'll see that where the conversations around the res go. I think I, I share um, Chair Sheldon's view. You know, it's it was a very contentious, very hot issue for a number of years. Um, I have, you know, mixed feelings about it. I talked about healing in the beginning. When you saw the pictures of what happened on the mountain in Lowell, it was quite devastating. It reminded me of someone immediately post-surgery, a hot red wound. You go over there 10 years later, there's been a lot of healing. Um, it looks much, uh, uh, so nature has a way of responding responding and rebounding um, and healing itself. Um, that's, so what I'm putting on the table is there is, uh, depending on when you're looking at these projects, they look very different to different parties and there's a lot of controversy behind it. Uh, I would say that an environmental, a deep long environmental neighbor of mine said to me, um, I'll be ready to go to the mountains to generate more power when we've done everything we can in the valley and um, so I also hear that kind of a message. Yeah, I'm, I'm in the all in approach. So the valley, the lake, the, the farm fields, every uh, opportunity we have to make improvements in whatever way, whether it's cover crops, whether it's solar panels in certain lower quality agricultural areas. I will say that from a, is there an appetite? That's a political question. I think there probably would be a majority in the House and Senate, but I don't think there would be two thirds. Uh, and for those of you that follow politics, you probably know what I'm saying. And it's in relationship to the comment that our attorney general said about the panel that's here with a fair amount of um, 
uh, mutual agreement around the importance of these issues and energy policy and our climate. Uh, but I would just add to the two thirds part that there's uh, someone missing from the panel. Uh, do you mind passing the mic down to our treasurer? I just, I just want to give my, my perspective in visiting towns through the campaign that had wind uh, in their communities. Can you raise your mic? Yeah, of course. Visiting the towns and communities that had wind, you know, um, previously before the, you know, there was sort of the stopping of building additional wind products. And, you know, they, I remember the town clerk going, opening up the book and looking at the property, um, you know, tax bills and looking at the rebates that everyone was getting in the local communities. And they said they, you know, they really appreciate this and that, you know, and, and that sort of thing. And that's good. But I think that communities should have more ownership in these kind of projects if they do get created uh, an actual equity ownership that they benefit as a community, uh, not just in terms of a payoff if you will, but that they actually benefit from the project itself. And I think you can then get a stronger community buy-in for this kind of project. I think it'll have more success locally. And then I think communities can be self-directed in the direction that they want to go. And so I just want to add that perspective in terms of, um, you know, our thinking about this and talking with community members in those towns that do have wind. I couldn't agree more. Uh, the island of Samso in off Denmark is a great example of community ownership. I will highlight that that is a double standard. We do not expect that from fossil fuel plants. We do not expect that from nuclear plants. We don't expect it from our gas stations. So again, going back to uh, what a few of you have talked about, it's education and it's a conversation with our fellow Vermonters. Um, I want to shift gears a little bit to workforce. Uh, since we do have the Deputy Secretary here, um, Office of Professional Regulation, uh, we had a lot of work to do and workforce shortages everywhere. What can your office do about that? So our office can make sure that the um, barriers to get into a profession are the appropriate level to protect the public, but not so it's not so high that people don't get into the profession. You know, uh, as Sarah mentioned, we do register home contractors. Uh, that's not, it's up and running. Uh, the program went live in, no, in um, April. We started building it in November of last year. Um, and it's completely mandatory in April of next year. So anything um, that you folks can do to get the word out, uh, we'd really appreciate the partnership on that. Um, and then we have strong partners over at the Department of Fire Safety who actually, um, they regulate plumbers, electricians, HVAC folks, um, and um, they really do the majority of uh, the work. So what we need to do is build apprenticeships and build, um, invest in um, career technical education. Again, that comes down to money. That's not something my office does. Um, but we need to make sure that there's a solid career path for this workforce and that we're talking about um, the major investments that are coming from the federal funds, from state funds, so that people coming through high school right now um, see this as a valuable career, one that is going to be here for a long time, and one where they can make a living. Um, so those are the things that I think we all should be talking about when we're building a workforce. Thank you. It is 12.20. I would love to keep going, um, but it is lunchtime, and I would love to ask one more question, but I'm going to stop. Thank you all uh, for your leadership, your vision, your courage, and please keep talking to each other and fellow states.